Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is the truth. We receive the word, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for bringing revelation. Thank you that we're going to take hold of it, and we're going to act upon it. We thank you it will produce the fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. This morning we began talking to you about the importance of the knowledge of God in your life. We must get the knowledge of God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. What should every minister or pastor or anybody in any aspect of ministering the Word, teaching the Word, be doing? They should be teaching knowledge. What's the person to do? Give good heed and sought out and set in order the many Proverbs, all the scriptural promises, all the scriptural points, all the scriptural truths that on a particular subject, and it's to set them in order. The preacher shall sought to find out acceptable words. That which was written was upright, even words of truth. That's what needs to be brought forth, the knowledge of God. Where's the knowledge of God? It's in the Word. That's why we've got to bring forth the Word. We see that there have been problems in the past, and we have problems today as well. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Without the knowledge of God, we're not going to be able to walk in God's ways, see His promises come to pass, and the devil will work and bring destruction against us because of a lack of knowledge. We see a problem that is spoken of over in Hosea. Hosea chapter 4, where in verse 1, the Lord said, You children of Israel, the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There's no truth, there's no mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. It should not have been that way. Why was it? Verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. If we reject the knowledge of God, we're going to see destruction come our way. He says, you reject knowledge, which is like rejecting God, because God's a God of knowledge. He says, I'm going to reject you. He said, you'll be no priest to me, seeing you've forgotten the law of God, I'll also forget thy children. However you treat God is the way he's going to treat you. That's what you must realize. You draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. You forget his word, he's going to forget your things that you're involved in. He is a God who responds according to covenant. And He wants us to know Him. And He wants us to come to the place of having the knowledge of God and walk in His ways. We're going to talk about knowing God and the things that He wants us to know about Him as well as things that He knows about us. In Genesis chapter 18, in Genesis chapter 18, we pick up down here in verse 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. Abraham was known by God. And what did he know about him? That he will command his children and his household after him. He wasn't going to let his household just do whatever they wanted to do. He's going to command them after the way of the Word of God. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. This is God's this word judgment here. We've talked about this in the past. It's 4941, Mishpat. It means God's governing rules of justice or His rules, justice rules. He's going to keep the way of the do justice, which is righteousness, and His governing rules of justice, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which He has spoken of him. What's that tell you? All the things that the Lord had spoken about Abraham, what he wanted to bring to pass, it wasn't necessarily going to come to pass unless he met the conditions. And what was the condition? They had to keep the way of the Lord, to do what was right, to walk in his ways, follow his rules, follow his commands. He said, I know him. He's going to command his children's household after him. God wants us to command our household to walk in line with the word of God and to do what is right in his sight and to follow the way of the Lord so that he can bring his blessings, the things that he has spoken concerning us, all the promises of God upon us in our life. In Genesis chapter 22, 
Here's where God tempted Abraham. And remember that he told him to go up to Mount Moriah with his son, and he was going to offer him there for a sacrifice. In verse 9, they came to the place that God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called out him of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon my lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham obeyed what God told him to do. He was willing to give his only son. And because of that, obeying and giving the most precious thing, God says, now I know that you fear me. That means that God knows what we're really like by the things that we do in obedience to his word that we carry out. He's looking for us to obey. We're going to prove ourselves. We're going to show ourselves obedient. We're going to show ourselves that we are really following the Lord. And he's going to know that you and I fear God because we're going to do the things that he commands us to do. Well, as, as he went forth and did this, of course, he provided the lent ram and the thicket. And he said down in verse 16, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thine son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. In multiplying, I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed, that's speaking of Christ, shall possess the gate of his enemies, because him willing to give his son made it so that now God could give his son, Jesus, in order to accomplish the redemption and to destroy the works of the enemy. But we see that now, he said, I know that you fear me. It's all because of obedience to God. God knows us, and we all sort of know many things that he's told us to do, the promises that he's given us, and things that he says he'll do. We need to know the things that he tells us. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, that which keepeth the covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God is a covenant-keeping God, and he keeps mercy. Who? With those that love him. He's a faithful God. There are conditions, though, remember. You've got to love him. Well, I love the Lord. Well, God says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So it's just not talk. It's shown by action. It has to be shown by action. Just like Abraham's action showed the fact that he had the fear of God. Your action shows whether you love the Lord or not. We've got to know that he's a faithful God who will keep covenant and mercy. But there are conditions to see that. These things aren't automatic. You and I are to keep the commandments of the Lord and show forth that we love him. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, that was where they're being proved and tested to see if they're going to follow him, to humble thee, to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether, you would, whether was, thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. God finds out what's in our heart when he tells us what to do according to his word and see whether we're going to do it or not. Because the wilderness is all pointing towards the testing in our life to see what we're going to do with the word. He's going to find out what's in our heart, whether we'll keep his commandments or not. That means in the measure that you're keeping his commandments and doing the word shows what's in your heart, whether you're following the way of the Lord. And God, we all are being tested in our spiritual wilderness, which is us in this life, walking out and doing the things that God has commanded, working out our salvation, following the way of the Lord, and carrying out the will of God. Verse 3 says, He humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know, or to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You've got to know that you live by the word. You live by the Word. Just like, you know, you get your necessary food every day. You live by the Word. The Word is spiritual food, and you need to get that spiritual food in you every day and live by it, walk by it, do what the Word says at all times. God wants us to know these things. 
He's going to prove and prove you and find out what's in your heart. And also, he's going to find out whether you live by the word or not. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God's going to find out. Do we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul? We can't, we can't just do things on our own terms. It's got to be God's way. He knows. He's looking upon the heart. He's seeing everything in our life. He knows and finds out whether we're walking in the ways of the Lord. We see another thing over in Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, we pick up down in verse 9. This is where Rahab, who was the only one that was saved at Jericho, she said, said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. She knew that because the Lord revealed that to her. I know that the Lord has given you the land. Well, you've got to know the same thing. God's given you the spiritual land, which are all the promises of God. And the terror has fallen upon all the enemies in the land. You've got to realize the devils are afraid of you. They know who is in you. They know the spirit of Christ is in you. They know you have a covenant with God. They know that, that you have the name of Jesus, the name above every name. That's why they got to deceive you. They got to do everything possible to get you not to know who you are in Christ, know your weapons, know, know the word of God, speak, act on the word, put it in operation, because they know that when you put those weapons in operation, they're going to be defeated. Also, all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. It's not because of you personally. It's because of who's in you. Who's in you? Christ is in you. The Spirit of Jesus Christ, the same one that defeated the devil, is living in you. You've got to know that God is on the inside of you. You've got to know he's given you all the promises of God. You've got to know that the devil's actually afraid of you. Although he'll try to use fear to get you to back off, he wants you not to walk by faith. He wants you to yield to anything causing you not to do the things of God. Joshua chapter 3, verse 10. Joshua said, Hereby shall you know, God wants us to know things, that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gargazites, Amorites, and Jebusites. Those are all the different enemies and different nations that were there. You've got to know the living God's among you, and he'll drive out every devil out of you. It's all the type pointing that we can cast out every spirit. God will drive everyone out. You don't have to think for a minute that he won't give you victory. The living God is on the inside of you, and he will manifest himself and destroy all of your enemies. You must also know, in June, Joshua 23, pick up in verse 3, You've seen all that the Lord your God has done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that has fought for you. You've got to know that the Lord is going to fight for you. Because who's doing the battle in the realm of the Spirit? The angels of God are hearkening and they are warring on your behalf and the Holy Spirit's power is going into operation to destroy the works of the enemy in your life. The Lord is going to fight for you. The battle's the Lord's and the victory is ours. And he talked about how he divided these, a lot these nations for inheritance for your tribes. And he said, the Lord your God shall expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. You shall possess their land. You got to know what God will do. God will expel all the evil spirits out of you, and you are going to possess the promises of God in your life. God has promised that. It's a promise of God. You've got to know what God will do for you. And he comes down here. He says, but cleave unto the Lord your God as you've done this day. There are some conditions. It's not going to happen if you just go off your own way and do what you want. You've got to cleave unto him. You've got to follow him. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he is that fighteth you, as he promised you. You're involved in this, remember, because you're going to get into the fight. God's going to do the work in the spirit, but you're going to chase or pursue after all the enemies. And you're going to be suing after a lot of enemies, driving them out. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that you love the Lord your God. You've got to have a right relationship with him and loving him and cleaving to him at all times. Else, in any way, else if you do in any wise, go back. If you go backwards and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you. 
Know for a certainty the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you. You go backwards in any way, God's not driving any more enemies out of you. In fact, the door's open for enemies to come into you. And you allow the enemies to come in and bring destruction against you in your life. There'll be snares and traps unto you, scourges in your sides, thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off the good land which the Lord your God has given you. God wants us to know that he will win, fight the battle and bring us victory when we do what he says. But if not, he's not going to be there. People think that God will just come, oh, God will always be there to help me on such and such. If you're not walking the ways of the word, he's not going to do a thing until you get right with him. So we, God wants us, he says, Behold this day I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. You've got to have that confidence in God, and you see that as you do his work. He's going to bring every promise to pass. Nothing will fail of the Lord. He's not going to fail you. His word will never fail. His word will come to pass. We just have to put his word in operation and do the things and meet the conditions so we can accomplish his great work. Over in Psalms, another thing he wants you to know. Psalms 9, verse 10. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. You've got to know the name of the Lord. The name of Jesus is the name above every name. When we speak in that name, every knee shall bow, things in the heavens, things in the earth, things under the earth. The name of Jesus has dominion. And when you speak in the name, you're releasing the authority, and it will destroy the works of the enemy. That's why you always do things in the name of Jesus. You've got to put your trust and know that it's the name through faith in that name. It's not just speaking the name without having faith in it. Remember at the gate beautiful in Acts 3? Acts 4, they give the testimony about it was the name through faith in the name that made this guy whole. You've got to have faith in the name and know that when you speak in the name, it's going to bring him personally present on the scene, manifesting his authority and power to bring forth victory for you in your life. Another thing we need to do, we've got to get ourselves calm before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, and allow him to minister unto us. Psalms 46.10, be still and know that I am God. He wants us to get still. He wants you to get quiet. He wants you to get in the presence of God and know that he is God. Don't let yourself be all full of anxiety, worries, tense, upset, all these kind of things. That's just gonna shut down. You're not gonna see the manifestation, the presence of God. He wants you to be in tune with him He's going to reveal himself. He's going to show himself strong on your behalf. We see also, what else does God know? Over in Matthew 7, in verse 20, he says, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. God knows us by our fruits, and yes, well, you're going to know people by their fruits as well. What's the fruits evidence of? It's the evidence they've been doing the word. You're going to know them by their fruits that they've been doing the word. Now, if they have bad fruit because they're not doing the word, you see they're doing evil things. You're going to know them by the fruit in their life. We have to be sure that we are looking, if we're dealing with situations with people, don't be following people. If you see, if you're doing some things with people, if you see some bad fruit there, that's a, that's a real red flag for sure. We've got to be watching out for those things. By their fruits, you shall know them. Just look at the things that, that they're doing in their life, and you're going to know what they're like. They certainly do not lie. In Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, of course that means he's also seeing the same thing in us. What kind of fruit do you have? If you've got some fruit that's good, great. If you've got some fruit that's not too good here. Well, God's going to know you that way, and other people are going to know you that way too. We've got to have good fruit doing the things of God. Mark chapter 4, he says unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will you know all parables? We're to know the parables. This is talking about the parable of the sower. All the things that he reveals of how the word working through the ground, which is a type of our heart, 
how the word will produce fruit and how Satan's activity to try to take the word out of our heart. We've got to know and understand these things so we see how God will accomplish what he purposes. And if we don't know this, how are we going to know all the other parables? Otherwise, obviously, this is a key to no other parables. So he wants us to come to know all these things. We also see in Mark chapter 12, over in verse 24, Jesus answered and said unto them, Do you not therefore err? They were being led astray. They were going on the wrong path. Why? Because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. God wants you to know the Scriptures, and you've got to know the power of God. Remember that we live by the power of God. And when the Word comes to you, the power of God is going to be resident in you as it's being written in your heart. The Word in your heart is going to produce that power of God resident within you. So that's why we've got to know the Scriptures. We've got to get the Scriptures in us. He wants you to know the Scriptures. You should know the Scriptures as well as you know anything. You need to know the Word that just comes out of you all the time. You speak that Word. You know that Word. You've got, you've got the Word before you. When something comes up, there's the Word. You've got the answer. You know what to do in every situation. And also the power of God. Because God's power is always going to come into manifestation through His Word as you act upon it with your faith in order to bring forth what He purposes. God is a God of power. Remember, we don't, we, we're not going to deny the power of God. Anybody that denies the power of God, we turn away from them. So He wants you to know the Scriptures, and He wants you to know the power of God that will be in operation. And you should know that when anything that God ever speaks, it's going to be the right thing. Look what happened here with Zacharias dealing with, remember when about uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they're going to have a child. When he comes, Zacharias said to the angel when he told him he was going to have this child, he says, whereby, sh whereby shall I know this? How am I going to know that this is going to happen? That was an angel from God speaking to him. He's doubting the Word of God. We should not doubt the Word of God. You say, well, I haven't had an angel come and talk to me, but I got the Word of God in front of me. Well, what is God speaking to us? What is he, how does he speak to us in these last days? He can use angels to speak, but it says he speaks to us by a son, and his word is the more sure word of prophecy. His word is the truth. Don't ever doubt his word. Don't ever think his word is not true. His word is the truth, and it is speaking to you and bringing revelation of his ways. When God says something, that's the word of the covenant that you entered into. So don't ever doubt it. Don't ever think, well, I don't know, how am I going to know this is going to come to pass? If God said it's going to come to pass, if he said whatever, if you do this, I'll do this, then you know it's going to come to pass. We should never doubt God's word whatsoever. We also need to realize that God will reveal everything that we have need of, of knowing in the word. Luke 8.10, he said, unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He wants you to know all the mysteries. Don't think that he can't reveal things to you. You get that kind of attitude, you'll just shut down revelation in your life. Long ago, I realized that the Holy Spirit said he would lead and guide us into all truth. I believe that scripture. That means he'll bring revelation to all the mysteries. If we just seek him, he will bring revelation. You need to believe that he will open your eyes and bring revelation to teach you all the mysteries of the kingdom. He's not going to hold anything back. He wants you to know all these things. He doesn't want you to be in the dark about anything. He wants you to get revelation of all these things. So know that God will reveal things as you seek him. We also see over in Luke, Luke in chapter 11, verse 52. Luke 11, down in verse 52. He said, Woe unto you, lawyers! For you've taken away the key of knowledge. You entered not yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. Boy, these guys, they were doing some evil things. They took away the key of knowledge. The key was a symbol of, of being able to acquire something from an Eastern mind. That was from Freiburg's uh, lexicon. So this key is this means of being able to acquire knowledge. Well, he took it away from them then. They didn't enter into themselves because they didn't seek after the Lord and the things that he told them to do to get revelation. And they hindered the people that were trying to enter in. God wants you never to be hindered. Don't ever let anybody tell you, well, we can never know these things. You know, God, we never know, we'll never know what all God will do. You know, all these kind of ridiculous religious statements that people say. 
You can know exactly what God will do. You can know the will of God. You can know His leading in your life. He's promised to lead us by a spirit. Therefore, don't believe any of these lies. God will bring forth the revelation, and we, you and I are going to enter in. Don't let anybody hinder you from entering into the things of God. Everything that He says, He wants you to do. Don't let anybody say, well, you can't do that. We can do everything the Word says. Don't believe any lies that will be sown in you. Another thing you must know, God knows your heart. He's looking upon your heart. Luke 16, 15, he said unto them, they, You are they which justify yourselves before men. God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. God knows your hearts. He knows that's where the seed of motivation is, the real desires on the inside of you that nobody else knows but you. He knows your heart, what you're after. God wants you, your heart to be right before him. For the perfect heart, he'll show himself strong on your behalf. He wants to be sure you don't have any ulterior motives anytime when you're dealing with things from your heart. He wants to be sure you're doing things upright and according to what God wants you to do at all times. And that you have a heart that is right with God and also a right, right with people as well. In John chapter 8, it tells us that you and I are to know the truth. We talked about that we're going to be all guided into all truth. Well, if we're going to be, God will reveal all truth to us, there's some things we need to do. It says in John 8, 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, that's our condition, our part, then are you my disciples indeed, that's the result of you continuing the word. What's a disciple? A disciplined one who's hearing and doing the word. And then it says you'll know the truth. See, I saw this long ago. Just because you study and you hear you get some things doesn't mean you know the truth. You know the truth by continuing in the word and becoming a disciple, otherwise doing the word. And the truth will make you free. We saw the scripture this morning. We'll show it again in John 3, 21. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. You want to come to the light? You need to do it. As you're doing the word, you're going to get revelation. You're going to come to the truth. It's not just learning things. It's also doing the word that is going to bring revelation as you apply it in your life. God wants us to know the truth. And what's the truth going to do? It's going to produce freedom in us. It's going to bring liberty in our life. Another thing that we see over in John chapter 10, in verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. God knows us, if we're true sheep, that is. That who are the sheep? The ones that are following him and walking right closely behind him. Remember, the sheep out in the field, they're right behind the shepherd, right on his heels. They're as close as possible. That's the way we are to be, as close to the Lord as possible. And he says, I'm also known of mine. That means he reveals himself to the sheep that are following him. God wants you to realize that he knows everything about you when you are a sheep following him. And you will be known of him if you will go walk in his ways because he will reveal himself unto you. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, as he said. So he, the Father know, knew me, so I know the Father. As Jesus knows you because you're close to him and you're walking his ways, then you will know him as well. That's the way it will work in your life. In verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He knows the ones who are his sheep. The real sheep are hearing his voice because they're hearing his word. They're hearing the voice. They, remember, God can speak to you through a still, small voice. He can speak to you through the word. He can speak to you, the Holy Spirit just bringing things to you, revealing things to you. He can speak to you through uh, other people that are used of the Lord to speak to you or whatever. But you're going to hear his voice from some way. It's going to be from his word. Who's going to hear the voice? My sheep. There's many people out there who all want to hear God's voice, but they're not a sheep. They don't, line, they don't measure up. They're a goat. They're just wandering around. I want God to tell me what to do. Well, become a sheep, and you'll hear his voice. What do you got to do to be a sheep? You got to be doing everything he says, 
following right on his heels, obeying his word. He says, I know them. And who are the sheep? What's evidence that you're a sheep? You're following him. And the measure you're following him is the measure that he would recognize you as a sheep. And you will be the one who will hear his voice, and God will know you. We see over in John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. How is somebody going to know you're a disciple? Because you walk in love at all times. If you have anger, you get upset, you get attitudes, you're negative in the mouth, you're showing all kinds of negative traits, what are they going to think about you? Uh, that's not a disciple of Jesus. He just looks like me, you know. He looks like everybody else out there in the world. Real disciples are going to walk in love at all times. He shouldn't, they shouldn't be seeing any negative character coming out of us. We need to deal with all those things and confess those sins and cast out those demons and get ourselves filled up with the Word. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. That's a trained one. If you have love one to another. So that means God knows his real disciples. And the real disciples always walk in love. It is a commandment. There is no other choice at all times in every situation in life. We see over in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 down in verse 21. It speaks of those who knew God at one time. We brought this verse out this morning. We'll bring it out again. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. That was a mistake. You've got to glorify God, give glory and honor to Him, and be thankful unto the Lord. You've got to treat Him like who He is. God, you can't take Him for granted. He's not a push-butt God. Oh, I need some help. God, oh, help, come on the scene and help me now. And the rest of the time, you just go anywhere you want. No. Do whatever you want. It's not going to work. You're going to glorify Him. You're going to be thankful in Him. Your eyes are going to be upon Him. You're going to be treating Him as God. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. That's what will happen, because God's going to treat you the way you treat Him, see. In verse 28, we come down here, even as they did not like to re retain or hold or have God in knowledge, there is not there, it's been added by the translator. They didn't like to have God in knowledge. How do you, when you have knowledge, you have God because God will be in the knowledge. He is a God of knowledge. Because they didn't like to have God in their knowledge. They added that just to show that it's talking about something in them. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, or a mind that's not approved, to do the things that are not convenient or were not right in the sight of the Lord. God will give you over to a mind to do wrong things if you don't want to keep His Word before you and retain His Word, have the knowledge of God and walk in it. Otherwise, you can't walk with God on your terms. You've got to walk with God on His terms, which is walking in line with His Word. If we don't retain God and knowledge in, our, in the Word of God in us, we'll end up over with a reprobate mind. This is why it's essential to put the Word of God first place in your life. And so these guys were unapproved before the Lord. And, of course, what they end up doing. They get filled with all evil things, all these evil things, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, all and on and on as it goes on. They did all these evil things, and it brought all types of curses upon them. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, you all sort of know that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. If there's sin in your life, God will always be working to try to bring you to repentance. He doesn't want you to see the devil just bring destruction against you. Because whenever you get sin, you give place to the devil. So he's going to want you to repent. Change your mind. Change your ways. Quit. You can't be walking the ways of sin and see God's blessings. So he's going to call you to repentance. Remember the woman even taking the over, overtaking the very act of adultery. He said, I don't condemn you. Just go and sin no more. He's saying, repent. Turn away from this. Walk in the right path. That's what God wants. He doesn't bring condemnation. The devil brings condemnation. God will bring conviction by the Holy Spirit to bring you to repentance, so, and he'll tell you to walk in the right way. It's the goodness of God. He's a good God, remember. 
and he wants to bring us to repentance in our life. So we need to know that. So don't ever think God's against you. No. Or don't ever think, you know, that he, he doesn't really doesn't want to help you in your situation. That's a lie. God will always call, try to do something good on your behalf. Evil things are coming from the devil, coming against you. Romans chapter 5, over in verse 3. He says, we glory in tribulations, or pressure, knowing that pressure, tribulation or pressure, works or brings into operation and performs patience or steadfastness. When pressure comes against you, don't get upset. Instead, rejoice in the Lord and know that that's the devil attacking you and he's going to bring into operation your steadfastness on the word. And why would the devil be attacking you? Because of the word in your life. He's trying to stop you from doing the word and seeing the victory. He's trying to stop you. He'll try to press, give pressure against you so you quit casting out or pressure against you so you quit speaking the word or quit praying or not spend time in the word where you should or do other things. That's the enemy working against you. It's going to bring into operation your steadfastness and your constancy when the word is in you. You're going to choose the way of the word. That is if you're choosing right. If you let it get, a hold, get to you and cause you to draw back, then of course that's not going to be a good thing. But at the same time, pressure will come against you. We're going to go through much pressure to enter in the kingdom of God. We're going to, it's going to work patience, steadfastness, bring in their steadfastness, which is going to be involved in bringing forth uh, the promises of God in our life. Remember, this parallel thing is talking about over in James chapter 1, in verse 2, when they were enveloped with all these, fall means to envelop and falls to be encompassed about with all these diverse temptations. They're supposed to be rejoicing, count it all joy. Knowing this, you've got to know, it's the trying of your faith. The devil's testing your faith. He's trying to stop your faith from working. What's that going to do? Works steadfastness again. The attack of the enemy, the test, whatever it is, it's going to work steadfastness if you've got your mind stayed on the word. If you don't, you're going to get blown away by the attacks of the enemy. That's why you've got to have the word established in your mind. So don't get all bent out of shape. Oh, this is the devil attacking me. I'm going to be steadfast on the word, and I'm going to see the victory come forth. It goes on and says, Let patience or steadfastness have its perfect work, that you might be perfect, entire, wanting, or lacking nothing. God will come through, and he'll bring forth victory for you if you'll be steadfast on the word of God, which is absolutely essential. Another thing you must know, over in Romans chapter 6, God has a lot of things he says in his word that he wants us to know. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth should not serve sin. God doesn't want us to serve sin. What's your body? It's a body of death. It's a body of sin. Sin dwells in the flesh, as he said. So your body, it's a body of sin. Yeah, I got a body of sin trying to get me to do sinful things. You better believe it. That's why you never can trust your body. You never can trust your feelings. You never can trust anything that's coming to you contrary to the Word of God. Henceforth, we should not serve sins. You've got to know this, this has been crucified with him. The body of sin might be destroyed. You can crucify the flesh and destroy all of the works of the flesh. That's why the Bible says you crucify the flesh daily. You mortify, put to death the deeds of the body. That is essential. So then you will not serve sin as you walk in the way of the Lord. We also see in verse 13 where it tells us, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of, un of, of righteousness unto God. Sin shall not have dominion over you. We should have, sin shouldn't have any dominion over us whatsoever in our life. And he comes down to verse 16 and he says, Know ye not, God wants you to know these things. Don't you know that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. That means whatever you're yielding your members to, you're yielding to a whom. You've got to know that. Well, I thought I was just yielding to a thought, negative thought, or negative feeling. No, you're yielding to a devil. You're yielding to a spiritual authority that is working through your members or through the flesh, working at you. Who, whom 
is the person you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That means when you yield anything that's doing contrary to the word sin, you just yield to the devil. You've got to know that. You get that m mindset before you say, I'm, I don't want to yield to the devil because I know what's going to happen. Destruction is going to come. I don't want to yield the devil with my mind. I don't want to yield the devil with my mouth. I don't want to yield the devil with what I'm seeing. I don't want to yield the devil with my, you know, words, anything that I'm doing. No, I'm going to guard myself. We're going to be obedient instead under righteous. You've got to know these things. So you don't think, well, you know, I'm just, just watching a few things that maybe I shouldn't watch, but it's no big deal. Or listen to some things, you know, or, or speaking some things. Oh, no. You've got to know you're yielding to a spiritual authority over you. And guess what? The enemy is coming in when you sin and you give place to him. That's how the evil spirits will come into us. As we mentioned, you've got to know in your flesh is nothing that's good. Romans 7, 18, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. You've got to know that. You'll never trust your body. You'll never trust your feelings. You'll never trust any thoughts or anything that comes to you if it's not in line with the Word of God. Too many people are led by their feelings. I hear it all the time. Well, I feel this way and I feel like that way. I don't feel like doing this and, you know, my feelings, I don't feel like this today. Just listen to what they say. Feel, 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 feel. It comes all the time. That's flesh, 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 flesh talking to them. And no wonder they're not doing the things of the Lord. I don't feel like doing this. If that's coming to you, the devil's been working on you through the flesh. Dwells no good thing. He says, well, the will's presently. How do I perform that which is good that I find not? What was the bottom line on this? Well, first of all, he came to the place of realizing, I got this body of death. This is a mess. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I got this body that's running me in sin and bringing destruction all the time. You know, I'm yielding to all these things left and right, speaking wrong words, thinking wrong thoughts, feelings, and so forth. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. And with the flesh, I'll serve the law of sin. That's where it all comes down to what's going on in your mind. That's the key. You've got to have the word in your mind so you know what to do in every situation. You will think on what the Word says instead of yielding to whatever thought, whatever feeling, whatever reaction comes your way. No, is this in line with the Word? Is this what God wants me to think on? Is this what God wants me to speak? Is this something that's coming from the Lord or is this the devil working at me? Your mind has got to get renewed to the Word of God, which is imperative. Another thing you need to know, Romans chapter 8, over in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You've got to know that you don't know what all to pray for as you ought. The word ought is a word die, which means is necessary, or Strong says necessary is binding. It is translated of the 106 times the main word it's translated is must. It is a covenant word, essentially. And it's saying that we know not what we should pray for as we must, or as was necessary, as binding. That tells you something. You and I are expected to pray in a way that's, ne that's necessary as we must. God wants us to pray that a, a way we should. So we're praying effectively. So. What do we do if we know we can't pray in all, the, in all the ways that we should? We'll just pray however I want to pray then. No. What does God say? The Spirit is going to make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is talking about not regular speech, this word not be uttered, that which is not normal speech or not expressed in normal words. What's this talking about? It's talking about praying in tongues or groaning the Spirit, some kind of spiritual praying that's coming out of you by the Holy Spirit. So what does this tell you? Since you and I don't know what to pray for as we must, as is necessary, means you need to be not only praying with your mind according to the Word, but you need to be praying in tongues. 
You can never pray for all the things you need to pray for, as you must, if you don't pray in tongues, because you don't know what all to pray for, as you must. Therefore, you should be praying in tongues all the time, in conjunction with praying with your understanding. If you don't have your prayer language, you need to get it. Everybody needs to be able to pray in tongues, because it's praying with your spirit. And God wants us to pray with that. Remember what it says over in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul said, you're going to pray with two things. What is it then? I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'm going to pray with the understanding. The understanding is the word noose, which means mind. You're going to pray with your mind according to the word that you know. But you and I know a drop in the bucket compared to the Holy Spirit, who knows everything. So praying with the Spirit is doing what? That's praying in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. This means God wants you to know you don't know all the things to pray for as you must. Therefore, you need to put your prayer language into operation. And if you don't use your prayer language very much, you're making a mistake because you don't know what all to pray for as you ought. We need to be praying in tongues as well as praying with our understanding so we see the will of God come to pass as we pray in the Holy Ghost. And that's important. I find a great majority of all the Christians out there that have their prayer, their prayer language don't use it very much at all. We should be putting our prayer language in operation. Pray in tongues. Pray with your understanding, and then pray in tongues in conjunction with that. Learn to follow the flow of the Holy Spirit as He's leading you and guiding you. In Romans chapter 14, another thing He wants us to know, verse 14. He says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. There's nothing unclean of itself. If all these ones that have all, want to follow the, the Old Testament dietary laws and think you can't eat this and you can't do this and all this stuff, if they just look at this verse and believe it, they'd throw all their, their, their teachings out because the Old Testament dietary laws were not under, were under the New Testament. We're not under that. There's nothing unclean of itself. Nothing. What defiles you? Sin. Not something that you eat. We're talking about spiritually. At the same time, well, I'll just go in and eat, eat all, anything I want. Well, you should be having wisdom in what you eat because not everything's nourishing to your body. Not everything's going to be good. You eat certain things that maybe, uh, you know, the, come from the scavenger, it's eat all the stuff, and it's not so nourishing to you, you're going to have a lot of negative effects on your body. You eat a lot of things, got all loaded up with these preservatives and stuff. You know, well, nothing's unclean. Can't hurt me. No, you can have lack of wisdom and eat things and cause a whole lot of problems in your life. So we should have wisdom about what we eat. We want to eat good, eat organic, eat natural, eat things that are, be wise in what you eat. But this is talking about, it's not, it's not a law in the sense that it's going to cause you to be unclean before God. We're not under that any longer. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, over in verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. That tells you the Holy Spirit knows everything. He knows all the things of God. Now we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. And what's he come to do? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That's why you need to rely on the Holy Spirit to bring you revelation as you're studying the Word. He's going to know, show you that you're to know the things that are freely given to us of God by the Holy Spirit. That's why it's important to receive the Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit's received after you're born again. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. First you get born again, you get the Spirit of Jesus Christ that comes from Jesus. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and it's received after you are born again. Remember in Acts chapter 8, when Paul preached Christ to those at Samaria, they got born again and baptized under Philip's ministry. Philip preached there at Samaria. And then what happened after that? Verse 14 of Acts, we'll show you this. Acts chapter 8, this is verse 5, where it talks about Philip preached, going to the city of Samaria and preaching Christ to them. In verse 12, they believed the things that Philip was preaching concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus. They got baptized, both men and women. They were born again, they got baptized. Did they have the Holy Spirit? No. 
No. When the, verse 14, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. This is a later time. What's Peter, what's Peter and John's mission here? When they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, why would they come to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit? Because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Obviously, it didn't ha come when they were born again. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's important for you to understand, you get the Spirit of Jesus Christ when you're born again, then you receive the Holy Spirit afterwards. And that's exactly what they did. They laid their hands on him and received the Holy Ghost. So, we got to know that all these things that are freely given to us by the Holy Spirit is going to reveal, but you got to get the Holy Spirit within you. Remember, the Holy Spirit is with those who are born again, but he hasn't come to dwell in them until they receive the Holy Spirit. That's important. In fact, show you, we'll come pick this in a sec, up sec, here, second here. What man knows the things of man? It said, even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. We receive the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, it says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. He's going to teach according to the truth, the Word of God, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He's going to bring spiritual revelation. That's why we bring the Word. We don't talk about man's wisdom. We bring the Word of God. And in talking, in one more verse here, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. You're never going to know things in the natural man. They're going to be spiritually discerned, spiritually revealed unto you. It's the Holy Spirit. That's why we need the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, to bring revelation. I see these people all the time that have not received the Holy Spirit, and they have a hard time getting a hold of the things of God because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the new birth. When you receive Jesus, you come into the body of Christ. But then it says we've all been made to drink into one spirit. Drinking is when you receive the Holy Spirit to come to dwell in you. Remember we talked about it in John 7, at the last great day of the feast, he said, come unto me and drink. What was he speaking of? This speaking of the Spirit, which those who believe on him should receive. What's that tell you? We receive the Holy Spirit, which is drinking, taking something into us to come into one spirit. All the people that are born again are in one body but they haven't come into one spirit yet. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you'll come into one spirit. You say, wow. Does another scripture say that? Sure does. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, because you're one spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwells in you. If the Holy Spirit's in you, you're in the spirit now. But if not, you're in the body, but you haven't come in the spirit yet. And notice what it says after that. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, that's what you get when you're born again, you're none of His. You don't even belong to Him. So that's what you get when you're born again, the Spirit of Christ. Well, I trust you understand this. That's important to understand. You get the Spirit of Christ when you're born again. That brought you into the body of Christ. Then you receive the Holy Spirit and you come into the Spirit because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell in you. What's He going to do? He's going to bring revelation of the truth to you. He's going to reveal the Word. He's going to be spiritually discerned. He's going to take that Word, write it in your heart and mind, and bring revelation. And that's how you get the mind of Christ established in you. Because if we go back to where we were, and that's how you're going to be able to deal with situations. It says they're spiritually discerned. And verse 15 said, He that's spiritual, he's got a spiritual mind, he's able to judge all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct them. But we have the mind of Christ. How'd they get the mind of Christ? By the Holy Spirit revealing it. God wants you to know that all the things of God are going to be spiritually discerned, and God, the Holy Spirit, is going to reveal all these things to you, and you are going to get the mind of Christ, and you're going to come to the place of being able to discern spiritually and to judge things spiritually because of having the Holy Spirit in you and the mind of Christ established in you. Not just because you have the Holy Spirit, but because you have the mind of Christ from the Word of God that's been revealed. That's why you're going to be able to discern things and judge things. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, 
you got to know you're the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. He's talking about the Corinthian church that had received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you. God's dwelling in you. We need to not be God inside minded in knowing the Holy Spirit, that's God dwelling in me. He wants to do great things. We'll just listen to him and allow him to have his way in our life. Otherwise, you can't walk after your own way. If any man defiles or destroys the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. He wants us to be sure that we take care of the temple of God and we aren't going to destroy it. But the Spirit of God has come to dwell in us and he wants to carry out all the things that he's purposed for us. In verse 20, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they're vain. All those people that think they're wise, they're vain devoid of the truth. They're useless, going nowhere. What do we need? We've got to have God's thoughts in us through the Word. You're only going to have any, be having the mind of Christ in the measure that you've got the Word in you. So you have His thoughts. So you're thinking according to His ways. So that's why we've got to really get the Word in us. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. He says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He says, I want you to know this. And what's he speaking to here? He's speaking here to the church where the, the man was having incestual relationships with his father's wife. It's terrible. And so they didn't deal with it. He said, you should have dealt with this thing. They, were, they were, should have mourned over this thing. They were, all, they were all puffed up about it and not even doing anything with it. And he says, know ye not that a little leaven, a leaven's a type of sin, leavens or contaminates the whole lump. It contaminated the whole church. Well, a little sin will contaminate you. That's why we cannot tolerate any sin in our life. And a little leaven will contaminate the church. That's why, of course, you can't have sin going on in the church. The people that don't deal with sin going on in the church, which a lot of pastors just let things go, that's a mistake. They got a messed up situation. And no wonder God's not doing anything because they're not coming in line with the Word. You, you can't allow that. A little leaven, a little sin will just leaven the whole lump. It'll destroy the whole deal. God wants us to get ourselves right with Him. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? We're going to judge angels. Does that mean, oh, automatically I'm going to judge angels? Well, if you haven't learned the Word, and you haven't come to the place of knowing how to rule and reign and walk in the ways of the Lord, are you going to, are you going to be judging angels? No. Who's going to judge angels? The ones that have the mind of the Lord, that know what they're doing. God wants us to come to the place of getting the, the mind of Christ established in us, walking in the ways of the Lord, so we'll be able to judge angels in the life to come. How much more things that pertain to this life. See, everything you're doing now is going to carry over to your position in the life to come. But many people think, oh, I'll just sail through this life and God will put me in a good place later. No, he won't. You're going to be rewarded according to your works. And you're also going to get according to the bad deeds you've done. Remember what it says. Well, I thought all the bad stuff was taken away. You know, Jesus washed away my sins, no problems, everything's gone. No, he may have washed away your sins, but your works aren't gone. They're still here. They're, they're written in the books. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he's done. Whether it be good or bad. Uh-oh, that means all the bad stuff. You're going to be having something happen. That's why we've got to cut out all the bad stuff. We want to be sure we're only doing good things. We don't want any sin going on in our life whatsoever. Do not let yourself yield to areas of sin. You're sowing bad seeds that are going to show up in your life now, of course, from the curses, but also the judgment in the time to come we're going to get those things. Remember, all of our works are going to be judged. All the things as it says over in 1 Corinthians 3, when we think about this. 1 Corinthians, that is. 3. 
Remember what he talks about in verse 14? Or verse 13 starts out, Every man shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, every man's work. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. All of our works are written in the books. And they're all going to be tried by fire. If any man's work abide, it passes the test, which he has built upon thereon, because you're building something in your life. He's going to receive a reward. Praise God, I'm ready for rewards. Well, wait a minute. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. If you've got a whole lot more suffering loss than rewards, you may not come out too well. You might be on the loss column more than the plus column. We want to be on the plus column. We want to be on the reward, lots of rewards. He's still saved, yet so is by fire, but he's going to suffer loss. So what's going to happen in life to come for him? Obviously, he's going to make it, but he's going to suffer loss as far as the rewards and his place in the life to come. That's why your works are so important, very important. Now, we see another thing over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And God wants us to know all these things. He, he wouldn't say to know these things if these things weren't important for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, we can't have any unrighteousness in us anymore. We've got to deal with it. Well, I thought I was perfectly righteous when I got born again. That's what they all tell me out there. What happens when you sin? All sin is unrighteousness. Well, if I got unrighteousness in me and sin, and I haven't dealt with it, I can't be perfectly righteous anymore. So what's the answer? Confess your sins, receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. Otherwise, deal with the sin in our life. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, be not deceived. And every time you see God say, be not deceived, why does he need to be saying this? God, in his foreknowledge, knew that people be teaching things that are ridiculous, that are false. And so he's trying to warn everybody, don't be deceived about this now. The unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom, knowing that people are going to say, everybody's going to get in the kingdom. You got your ticket to heaven. You're born again. It's okay. No, it's not okay. He goes on and says, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers themselves of mankind, which would be a homosexual. Look in the lower window. These guys are in trouble. Thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners shall inherit. None of these are going to inherit the kingdom of God. These guys that say, well, once saved, always saved, and you commit fornication and you would die at that point in time, you'll still make it. It's a lie. You're, com you're abiding in fornication and you die. You're not going up. You're going down because you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicators don't make it in. Well, wait, I thought that, I thought that pastor or that teacher told me that we're all going to make it in. Revelation 21, 8 says, The fearful, the unbelieving, the bombable, the murderers, and the whoremongers, which is pornos, which is talking about the fornicators, as well as the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone, the second death. Doesn't look like they make it in. They're going to be fried. Therefore, don't believe those lies. We can't have unrighteousness in us. Unrighteousness has to be dealt with. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians 6. Well, that means the unrighteous, they're not going to get anywhere. So, we come down to verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? See, he bought the whole deal, spirit, soul, and body, including this body of death that isn't got right yet. But it, because he's going to get you a new body when we get a glorified body. Right now, it's not right, but he did buy the whole deal when he redeemed us. The whole deal belongs to him. Your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? How would I do that? By fornication. Because what happens when you commit fornication? You disjoined yourself to another person that's not in covenant relationship with you, and you committed fornication. Fornication is joining yourself to someone that's not in covenant relationship with you. God forbid, he says. No, what? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot's one body? 
for two saith he shall be one flesh. That's terrible. We shouldn't be doing this. Is what you have to realize that fornication, it wasn't just some, you know, fun time one night or for a period of time or whatever. No. It was joining yourself to someone else, spiritual fornication. Fornication is a spiritual effect where you've joined yourself. He that's joined the Lord is one spirit. How can you join yourself? If, you're, if your body's the member of Christ, how can you join the member of Christ to some, a harlot or someone else that's not in covenant relationship with you? That's a no-no. That's what happens in fornication. Flee fornication. Don't let yourself ever get in fornication again if you've ever been in it in the past. You flee fornication. Every sin that a man do doeth is out of his body, but he that's committed fornication sinneth against his own body. Hey, you're bringing curses on your own body. Well, I didn't think anything. I didn't feel anything. Uh, spirits came in, and you may not see it right now, but guess what? They're there. In fact, if you've been involved in fornication in the past, you need to be casting out all these spirits that have come into your body because you better believe they've come in. You're sinning against your body. The Satan is accusing you of the brethren, accuses the brethren of our sins night and day, and you better believe those demons were coming in. That's for sure. What know you not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is you. You've got to know this. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You can't do with your body what you want to do. You've got, you got to do with your body what God says you can do when you're in line with his word. That's why in marriage you come into covenant relationship. And then part of the covenant relationship is the consummation in one flesh, you know, in the relation, sexual relationship. But you, you know, you don't do that before. You have, he says, you're not your own, as he says. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body as well as in your spirit, which are God's. He's got the whole deal. Therefore, you can't make your body a member of Christ, a member of a harlot. Stay away from it. You say, well, I haven't done any of those bad things. I do have a problem with my eyes, though. This internet thing does get a hold of me. Uh, well, you got a problem there. Because, remember, that adultery is what? Whosoever looks on a woman to lust after has committed adultery with her already in her heart. It's not just an act thing now. It's a heart deal. Whatever you do in your heart, you commit it. That's why you've got to guard yourself. You could be committing this thing in your heart by allowing yourself. So guard yourself so you don't look on someone to lust after them. Stay away from all those things. Otherwise, you've got to know that this is going to bring destruction upon you in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. If everybody be taught that in the body of Christ, they'd get their act together, wouldn't they? Instead of making mistakes. It's amazing how many of Christians have gotten into these things because they didn't know these things. A lot of times, so they didn't, didn't look at the Bible. 1 Corinthians 8. It talks about how knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. If any man think that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. If you think, hey, I, I've really arrived here. I, I got all this great knowledge. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty good here. You made a big mistake. We know a drop in the bucket compared to God. So don't ever get big-headed and think that I, I, I know all these things. You think you know something? You know nothing as you ought to know yet. Always stay humble. Never let pride get a hold of you and think that you know something. Uh, you're going to be taking yourself down a path of destruction. Pride will bring, pride goes before a fall, remember. Can't allow that. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. We'll finish with this scripture, these scriptures. Know ye not, these are things he wants you to know, that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. Cata Lombano, lay hold of and take hold of it. What do we run in to obtain? We're running to obtain the mastery and the prize of the promises of God and all that God has given us, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Every man that strives for the mastery, which is what you're to be doing, you just don't just get along. God wants you to strive 
for the mastery in everything. And this means you're going to contend with the adversary. It's a word of Gana Idzamai, which is the same word translated fight in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Everyone who's fighting and contending with the adversaries and striving for the mastery over the enemy, he's got to be temperate in all things, self-controlled. What do you need to keep in self-control? Your body, your flesh that wants to run you. You've got temperance is the, is the fruit of the spirit, which is a spiritual force that keeps your body in check so you don't yield to the flesh. He wants you to be temperate in all things. Well, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We, an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run. Remember, we're running the race. Not as uncertainly. Otherwise, I know where I'm headed. I have a lot of Christians, I've heard a lot of Christians say, I just don't know what to do in my life. I'm kind of bored. I don't know what to do. I think, you're not even tuned in to anything. You don't even know what this, what's everything all about. You have no earthly idea of what you're supposed to be doing. They obviously haven't been taught anything. We're to be running the race, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to possess all the promises of God, to carry out the ministry of the Lord, to work out our salvation, to cast all the demons out and crucify the flesh and get rid of all this filthiness so we perfect holiness in the fear of God, to do the works of God, to be piling up the rewards in our life, to be serving the Lord. We should be doing all these things, getting the knowledge of God, walking worthy before Him, getting full of power, going out and doing the mighty works of the, of the Lord, casting out the demons, helping people get set free. How can you be bored? How can you be saying, I don't know what to do with my life? <laughs> You're not tuned in, anybody that thinks that way. There's a lot of them out there. You know why? Because they haven't been taught right. They got all this other carnal teaching. We know where we're headed. We're running a race, and we're going for that prize. So fight I. Fight? What fight? It's a spiritual fight against the devil that you're to conquer. Not as one that beats the air. Am I hitting anything? You better believe in the spirit you're hitting the enemy and you're destroying his works. You're casting those devils out. You're binding, loosing. When we're praying, we're not just hitting in the air. I wonder if anything's happening. If you're thinking that, you're going, you're going nowhere. No. When we bind those spirits, they're bound. When we cast them down, they're being cast down. When we're praying and the angels are going forth, they're going forth and warring. When you pray the Word of God, God is moving and going forth and accomplishing these things in the realm of the Spirit. We're fighting, not as one that beats the air. No, we know where we're headed. We're do everything's done in the Spirit, remember. I keep under my body. Now, that's important. Remember, this body can be a problem. I keep under this body. This means, essentially, the word keep under. It's like to box the body, beat it black and blue, smite it, buffet it like a boxer. I'm going to make sure this body does not do anything that's wrong. You don't let your body run you. Body, you're going to do what the Spirit says. I don't feel like it. Too bad. You're going to pray. You're going to get in the Word. You're going to do what it says. You're not going to, you're not going to speak these negative things. You're not going to, have, you're not going to give place to this. Otherwise, you're going to tell your flesh, your body, what to do. I'm going to keep this body under. I'm going to beat this thing down if I have to. I'm going to buck. I'm going to do whatever I got to do to keep this thing under control. And I'm going to bring it to subjection, which means what? I'm going to lead it away into slavery. Body, you're my slave. Feelings coming from my body, you're my slave. You don't tell me what to do. I'm telling you what to do. We are walking in the Spirit, and we're doing what the Word says. And you're going to come in line and do what the Word says. We're not going to do what you feel like doing. Do not listen to your body. You lead it as a way as a slave. You make it your slave of the Spirit. And he says, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself, Paul's speaking here, I could be a castaway or unapproved or not standing the test and be reprobate. Paul says, I could get reprobate myself if I don't get this in line. So we got to know that you and I are running the race. See, God, he tells us all the things he wants us to know. Know this, know this, know this. Why? Because you and I need to know. We have to have the knowledge of God and understand what is going on. What are we doing? We got to know that we're running the race. We're going to get the prize. We're going to contend with the devil. We're going to have to keep this body under, bring it to subjection. We're going to be temperate in all things. 
We're going to be fighting that fight. We're going to be running that race. We know where we're headed in the spirit. We're fighting that fight in the spirit. We're not just hitting nothing. We know how as we're doing the word. We're conquering the enemy. And we're going to see that if we keep our body under and bring it subjection, then we will be successful and we will see the prize be obtained. The high calling of Christ Jesus. We will obtain everything that God has for us. They're running to obtain a prize. You're running to get the victor's crown, the prize of the victor in Jesus Christ. He made you more than a conqueror. He wants you to get the victory in every area. So don't ever settle for defeat. Don't just settle in to this well, is the way it's going to be. No. You go after the promise of God, and you run after the promise to take hold of it. You're going to have to fight the fight to conquer the enemy. You will get the victory in your life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that tells me all these things that I am to know. I'm going to take heed to your word. I will know these things. I will do what your word says. I will know what you will do. I will know the conditions I must meet to see these things come to pass. I am going to know all these things and do what your word says so that I see the victory and I please you and bring forth fruit, be a real disciple, possess promises, conquer enemies, run that race and receive the prize. I thank you, Lord. I will know these things and I will do what they say. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We got through about half of this. We're Wednesday night, we're going to continue on and finish the rest of what we're going to talk about, about things that are important for you to know. You know these things, so you don't make any mistakes. No, I love rules 11, 11 a whole lump. I can't let sin get a hold of me. Well, a little bit of sin, you know, everybody's going to sin. That's what everybody says out there. You know, you should hate sin. The Bible says strive and fight against sin. That's not exactly just allowing it to work whenever it shows up every once in a while. So you've got to have the Bible mind on everything. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to have the word, knowledge, so we walk in the ways of the Lord, and we're going to see victory in our life. We're going to please God. Father, we thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. Thank you for your word. We will take heed to it. We will know these things. We will know what you will do. We'll know all our responsibilities, know the conditions. We'll carry it out, and we'll see the fruit from the knowledge of God in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Wednesday night, we'll continue on and talk about the rest of this as we go through the New Testament of things that God wants us to know. Praise God. If you need prayer, I want to invite you to come forward. Otherwise, God bless. Be a doer of the word. Walk in the knowledge of God and see victory come forth in your life. Wednesday night, we continue. God bless. You're dismissed.